Well, good morning, everyone. I am Todd Misfelt, one of the pastors here at Christ Community Church, and it's a pleasure to be in front of you all today, and those of you online, too. So our scripture for this morning is from the letter from James to the church. And James is in kind of an open letter to the entire church. And he challenges believers that our faith is meaningless unless it is backed up by action. And so James includes in his letter quite a bit of pieces of, of wisdom for Christians, for members of the family of God to, to follow. Now included here is in James, um, James 5, there's um, that 13 to 20 focuses on healing and prayer. And these are, are very deep topics that you may have heard talked about before. For instance, verses 14 and 15 of chapter 5 focuses on the sick and prayers for healing. And verses 17 and 18 focus on earnest prayers and how God will respond and act to those. Now, many messages have been given on these various topics, but Today, in, in light with our theme of the fam, being a member of the family of God, we're going to focus particularly on four verses here. And these verses describe how members of the family of God can help each other to be healed. And this will help members of the family of God not only be healed from sin, but also return to spiritual health. So, please stand as Rachel reads our passage for this morning. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is any among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will, will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and, and, and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Thank you, Rachel. You may be seated. So in our, our passage that Rachel just read, James teaches a number of things, and one of these is about spiritual healing. Now, healing is a process of becoming sound or healthy again, and spiritual healing is a process that brings us back to God. Now, spiritual healing begins with the recognition that there is an issue, and, and James instructs the family of God to pray in all circumstances. In addition to that, we are to confess our sins to one another. And these help, you know, these help us grow spiritually healthy. And, and this confession helps us to be, we get to be held accountable so it's not just something we can say and release. You, you hear confession in the media all the time. A, a politician confesses that they've done something wrong, but they're not held accountable. For spiritual healing to take place, we must be held accountable. Well, today we're going to hear stories about James's advice in action. So one is a story about being held accountable. 
Another is about returning to the family of God and who, someone who has wandered away. And in this story, there's also a caution how we can unintentionally cause harm by being judgmental. Now, each of us as members of the family of God has a, can learn from these stories. And by learning from these stories and, and acting with James' advice, we can help God's family function the way that God intended. So this morning, we'll have four contributors to this. These, these folks happen to be member of the uh, steering committee for the young adults, but we have Rachel Foss, Zach Barnes, and Zare Blanco, and myself. Now to our message. So first, James gives us advice that all members of the family of God should follow. That is to pray and rejoice. Verse 13 says, is any, anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. In other words, James is telling us that prayer is for all situations, not just one or the other. We should pray in good times and in bad times. Prayer keeps our focus upon God and acknowledges that he is in control, both of our lives and of our community around us. And prayer is a conversation with God that can remind us of, and we can remind each other about this. Now, verses 14 and 15 speak of prayer for physical healing. And I'm sure you've heard this around you. However, we should not pray only for physical healing. We must also pray for that spiritual healing I mentioned that will bring us back to God if we have wandered. Now, one reason we can become distant from God is that because of our disobedience to his will. And this results in a state or behavior in us and that is not what God intends us to be. And today we will use the word sin to describe that, that distance from God or what causes us to be distant. Now, one reason we can be distant from God is because of our disobedience to his will. This should be nothing new, but this, and, and God forgive, forbids this disobedience because it hurts us. It hurts our relationships with others and with God. And what's more, we can choose to ignore this disobedience, no matter how much it's hurting our relationships with God and others. So to become healthy, we need to stop ignoring our sin and seek help. This is where being part of the family of God comes in. So the first step in returning to God is confession. James commands this in verse 16. He says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Confession forces us to admit that there is a problem and to acknowledge specifically what that problem is. You know, confession blasts through our comfort zone, blasts through our emotional resistance to the real root of the problem, our reluctance to conform to God's will. And if, so if we don't confess to our sin, we will not be healed. Now, in, if you look at it, if we're not willing to confess our sin to another person, then perhaps we're not really ready to repent. Our ego is getting in the way, and we're not willing to be subject to God's will. And the family of God helps us in this situation by being available to hear one another's confession. So, start off with a question here. How many people here confess their sin on a regular basis to another person? Raise your hand. Okay, I see some, not everyone. 
And in one way, this is not surprising because this takes effort and it takes humility. Now, I have some confession, some experience with confession without accountability. I grew up Catholic and being then part of the practice of being Catholic is going to confession. And as a child in grade school, I remember there was little sets of rooms in the sanctuary called confessionals. And when confessions were being heard, you would go into one of these rooms and, you know, close the door behind you. And the priest would slide open a little door exposing an opaque screen. I would then confess my sins. The priest would absolve me or forgive my sin and then give me some penance to do like say five Hail Marys and two Our Fathers, you know, some, some prayers. But as I think about that today, did my confessions really help me change my behavior? You know, for me at the time as, as a young lad, my, I was probably going through the motions and I'm not sure I really felt true repentance. And I don't think it changed me that much, which, which is the, the objective of confession. You know, perhaps it was because it, because it was anonymous and no one held me accountable to it. That's where confessing your sin face to face with another person makes us accountable and moves us toward spiritual healing. As an example, Rachel has some experience with this kind of authentic confession. Hi, everyone. Recently in my life, I have come to see how freeing it is to confess my sins, shortcomings, and resentments. About a year and a half ago, I realized that I was codependent. Codependency isn't a word that is used in the Bible, but it is reflected in Scripture as the concept of idolatry. I used to rely on others to fulfill all of my emotional needs, and I put other people on a pedestal. Trying to win the approval of others caused me to lose sight of God in my life. I tried to change people and was so tied up in other people's lives that I would let their personal feelings impact how I felt about myself. All this time that I was trying to spend controlling others was time that I wasn't focusing on what God was trying to do in my own life or what God was trying to have me change about myself. I was resentful of the people that I loved, and I also felt insecure and powerless. At first, I tried to pretend that I had everything put together, but I was lying to myself and to God and to other people. So I put this on the screen because this is us trying to hide our sin and this damages our relationships. And this is kind of how, what we look like when we're trying to hide from God with our big mess. And it's pretty obvious. Uh, so it can feel scary to be vulnerable and to let other people into our lives and to let them know what's really going on. Sin separates us from God. Think back to the Garden of Eden. When we sin and feel guilt, our first humanly instinct is to run and hide away from God, which is funny since we can't actually hide from him. And we look about as silly as the dog. <laughs> God wants us to have a personal, intimate relationship with him. But we can never have that if we're hiding from him in shame. Our shame ruins our relationship to God, and it also ruins our relationship with fellow Christians as well. Eventually, for my own life, it started to become too dysfunctional for me to manage by myself. When the, fear, when the hurt outweighed my fear, I joined Celebrate Recovery. Celebrate Recovery is an incredible Christian 12-step program that offers a safe place to work through any hurt, hang-up, or habit. In Celebrate Recovery, one of the principles is to openly examine and confess my faults to myself, to God, and to someone I trust. There I met 
other Christians who opened up about their brokenness that they were wrestling with. They shared about their sins openly and honestly, and they did not judge me when I shared what I was struggling with. I met with my fellow sisters in Christ, and we confessed our sins to each other, and we prayed for each other so that we may be healed. And let me tell you, my, the prayers of my strong family in Christ was powerful and effective. My family was able to help me examine the areas in my life that I needed to change, and they gently convicted me to start making those changes in my life. They were so supportive and helped me overcome my challenges, and I really wouldn't be to where I am today without them. I really needed to have that in my life, having those strong people around me in order to change because there was a lot of things I didn't know I needed to change until I was able to open up and they were able to help me. And this is really important to open up to other people because Satan wants us to stay afraid and lying to ourselves and to our Christ family, pretending that we can do it all by ourselves and that we have it all figured out. Instead of remaining in denial and being ashamed, we always have the opportunity to ask each other for prayer and support. It is important that, when, that we are able to hold ourselves accountable and to be honest with each other and fess up when we make mistakes and sin. All of us sin, so it's okay to talk about it. We need to connect to others and rely on them for support. None of us in here are perfect. We're all struggling with something. If we were all perfect, then we wouldn't need Jesus anyway, and we could all go home. So it's important that we talk about it, because we need Jesus. We heal as we are honest with one another about how we are struggling and what sins are tripping us up. When we confess to our fellow Christians, then we can hold each other accountable. And this is really important. Healing is not done alone, but by staying connected to those who love us and who have the best intentions for us. I'm going to wrap up my part by reading Psalms 32, 1 through 5. What happiness for those whose guilt has been forgiven. What joys when sins are covered over. What relief for those who have confessed their sins and God has cleared their record. There was a time when I wouldn't admit what a sinner I was, but my dishonesty made me miserable and filled my days with frustration. My strength evaporated like water on a sunny day until I finally admitted all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide them. I said to myself, I will confess them to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Well, thank you, Rachel. Well, Rachel's experience shows us the benefits of authentic confession and accountability to a group of people that she can trust. Now, these people can be from the family of God at this church, or in, in Rachel's case, at Celebrate Recovery. But that's only the case for the family of God here if we've taken the time to build those relationships with each other. So that's uh, it's one of the pieces of advice from James that is implied by that, that we have to build those relationships. Now, Speaking of the family of God, another way the family of God helps each other towards spiritual healing is by paying attention to those in need and, and help when needed. As James says in verses 19 to 20, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. Well, Zach has some experience that sheds a little light on the scripture in the context of the family of God. Thanks, Todd. So this summer, I had the uh, wonderful privilege of helping out with uh, VBS and sports camp. And 
it was a lot of fun. We, you know, played games, sang songs, had a lot of goldfish. Uh, the main point is to share the gospel with, with, our, with our children. Um, I, I can speak from my own experience of, of years of doing this. I, I hit a certain point where, um, you know, I started asking myself, like, how, how, how can this gospel message that I'm sharing to these five-year-olds still be relevant to my life? Do I, does, does this still make sense to me? Does, is this useful to me? Um, and I, I work with uh, some of the middle schools and high schools, and I, I see the same thing in them. They're asking the same questions, which is, you know, this, what, what, what I'm sharing these five-year-olds, is this, uh, you know, is, this is comforting for, for them maybe, but for, for me, the, do, I, do I care about this? Do I believe this? So I also grew up in this church just like Rachel, and I've seen many of my peers fall away from the faith. People are, are quick to come up with whatever reasons why this is happening. Um, but I want to take the, the angle that James is, is talking about, and I think it's more helpful to consider, which is that we should be emphasizing the great uh, relational and spiritual rewards that come from um, bringing them back. So how do we help somebody who's wanted from God? It's not enough to just say hi on a Sunday or you know, keep them in thoughts or prayers. We have to build real relationships and these take time. We have to listen through and work through years of, of doubt um, this, our, um, this person may be experiencing. So I've been, I've been learning more about how being in the family of God is less about being in front of a stage and more about being around a small table of other believers and sharing our lives together over long periods of time. This is especially relevant for, for our young adults here because we're not just going to do something, j- just do something. So there's, there's a great reward now for um, bringing believers back and helping others find the truth, not just some imagined future in heaven. Well, James calls us to help each other back to our faith through our friendships. And this should be our goal, all of our goal, to be positioned to help each other. However... We also need to be aware that there are times that we don't help turn people back to God. And in fact, we do the opposite of helping, and we may unconsciously drive them away from the family of God. We can do this when we either judge or or even just appear to judge those around us. And something like this, instead of building up the family of God, tears it down. We, we add to the wounds that they're already suffering with instead of helping them toward spiritual healing. Well, Zir experienced this, and we, let's hear his story. Yeah, thanks, Todd. Um, yeah, I was a different man uh, back in college. Uh, despite how I uh, lived my life, I, uh, I tried making efforts to get involved in community. Um, it's probably about halfway through college, sophomore, junior year. That's when I, uh, actually one of my, my friends, um, she, she was on the softball team and we were talking and she, she mentioned to me how she was involved in, in community and in a church and in a college group. And it threw me off because her and I, we partied together. (laughs) And so I was like, oh, okay, I guess that's a thing. You party and go to church. So, that inspired me, and I was like, okay, if, if you can do that, I guess, let me, let me give it a shot, too. So I did that. I, I tried going to the church she was at, and it, it, it was difficult. It was, it was pretty hard for me, given that she's a girl and I'm a guy, so she was with you know, women's, uh, women's group, and I was with the, the men's group. And I went, and what made it really difficult is what I was involved in. So uh, I went to Chico State and I was on the track team and I was also part of Greek life, a uh, fraternity. And when you're involved in those two things, there's a certain stigma uh, that comes with that. So when the community I was in, they found out what I was involved in, instead of seeing where my heart was, they immediately uh, assumed that I had the wrong reasons to be there and that I had the had impure atten- uh, in- intentions. And all of a sudden, they just kind of stopped trying to get to know me. 
and they just thought, okay, all right, there's just another frat boy here. And that, that, that really hurt me because I, I was genuinely really trying to uh, get back in the family of God. And like I said, this was halfway through college. And because of that, it left a sour taste for me. And so I, I, was, I was like, okay, I guess I just don't belong here. So I, I, I stepped away, lived a life of sin, um, and I wasn't part of a community for a couple of years. Although I was raised in a, in a Christian home, I'm very thankful to my parents because they never forced me to go to church, never forced me to be involved in any of that. And I'm, and I'm really very happy and blessed um, for that. It actually wasn't until October of uh, 2021. And mind you, this was a time when I was still living a sinful life, so I wasn't really uh, involved in any sort of community. Um, I had you know, no one inviting me to church, none of that stuff. And it was October of 2021. One day I just, I woke up and out of nowhere, I felt like this tugging and I'm like, okay, I guess let's, let's, let's go to church. Well, let's, let's, give it a try, let's give it a shot again. And at, at this point I graduated college already. Um, I was 23, 22 at the time. What I realize now that I didn't realize then is that tugging, that feeling of, of coming back to church, of, hey, let's go find something, that wasn't me, that was the Holy Spirit within me. And so I understand now that I truly am saved, and so I'm thankful for that. Um, and although what I, what I went through was a little difficult, I, I realized that I had to go through that so that I can come from a place of understanding and acceptance when I speak with others who have gone somewhat through the same journey I went through. And a perfect example of that is a coworker friend of mine. We were talking, she, she, she started sharing some things with me. Uh, out of nowhere, she, she mentioned that she was raised in a Christian home. She's trying to get back to church. And I think the reason why she was so open with me and was able to share some personal things is she knew that I was coming from a place of acceptance and I didn't judge her. And, and I think that's why she, she, was, she was very just honest with me. And I think that's one of the reasons why I had to go through what I go through so that I could be put in a place and listen to others intently and, and see where their heart is despite what they're involved in or whatever things they have done. And, you know, going through my, my story, it's, it's somewhat kind of like the disciple Matthew. Ironically enough, one of my favorite disciples is actually Peter. Um, but Todd actually helped me realize this story is kind of like Matthew in that he was a tax collector and people did not like him because of the occupation and what he was involved in. But Jesus looked past it. He didn't even consider that because what he saw, he, he saw that, okay, I can use Matthew to reach people outside of the faith who need it more than who's in the faith. You know, and this passage of James that we're talking about, our, our job as part of the family of God is to listen and understand where everyone comes from and, and really to not judge and to be accepting. I know as humans, it's, it's, it's hard for us to do that because we're not perfect and that's okay. Um, you know, we, just, we don't have the authority to judge. That's, that's God's job, uh, not ours. Yeah, so kind of talking about um, being in the family of God and Zara went through an, like an unideal situation. So in an ideal situation, um, we actually have these, these deeper relationships, uh, maybe one or two really close uh, relationships that we can actually share deep parts of our, our lives with. And many young and old don't have this. It was hard for me to realize this a couple of years ago that I, I didn't really have anybody I could share this with. And, um, you know, I, I started to cultivate this with, with some of the um, closer men that I, that I know. And these relationships, they... They can't be formed when we're, we're busy and only come a couple Sundays a month. So I'm, I'm challenging myself. I'm challenging others to consider in their lives if they have someone they could maybe start this with. Um, these relationships, they, they'll take many years and they won't just happen by chance waiting around. So we have like our larger circle of family and friends, which we do fun things together and it's great, but 
life is, is not all fun. We, we have our, our storms, we have our, our tough um, spots that we go through, and if we only interact at a superficial level with our, with our family, we won't have people who can help us when we go through those things, and this can leave a, a hole in our spiritual lives. Yeah, we have a great group of fellow members of the family of God right here. So, anyway, as Zach says, the challenge for all of us is to have close friends so that, you know, from Jane's standpoint, so that we can be opening to listen to their confessions and someone we can confess to. And this, in turn, helps with spiritual healing. But again, for this to be possible, we have to be close to other members of the family of God. And I think that's a, a lesson that goes with the series. And we, we do this, as Zach said, by getting to know each other on a deeper basis. We can also expand the circle of our friends and like, for instance, go, you know, outside. There's lots of people here. I don't know everyone. I don't think anyone here knows everyone. But get to meet someone new after the service. You know, know their name. Remember it next week. You know, maybe invite them to a meal. And build a relationship no matter how young or old they are or how different they are from you. I particularly like build, you know, getting to know someone who's different than I am because that's, it's full of wonder and surprise and they're usually very wonderful people behind those, those differences. Well, in conclusion, you know, we've heard a number of diff different perspectives on how we as members of the family of God can be authentic. And the wisdom of James 5, 5 tells us that we need to be authentic in our faith. And if necessary, we have to confess our sins to turn, to turn us back to the way that God wants us to be. And as we've heard, for this to happen, we must cultivate those close friendships. But as you've also heard, each of us, as members of the family of God, has a role to play in this process. And if we do that, then the family of God functions the way that God intends, with a love for God and for each other. And thank you all for joining us in worship today, both in person and online. It is such a pleasure to worship our Lord and our God. And it's also a pleasure to be part of the family of God. I, I hope you get a sense of that from our message today. So as usual, we have our, our kind of our four key words to focus on as you go out. First, there's prayer. As, as James says, pray always in joy and in sorrow. But pray and maintain that relationship with God. Grow, you can, you know, there's we provide you opportunities here. Grow in friendships with each other. Grow in knowledge of God by going to a life group or attending some of the classes that we offer. And give, give of your time, talents, and treasure. The, the young adults who are up here with me all serve. Rachel's a deacon. Zara and Zach help with the youth. And they always need more youth, more advisors to help that. And serve as, you know, as James said, our faith is useless unless we put action to it. And in addition, you, you've heard Rachel talk about her, her experience with Celebrate Recovery. Okay, guys. So I'm going to be giving my full testimony uh, 20 minutes after the service here. It's going to be in the room over there called the Everglades. And I'll be talking more about Celebrate Recovery because I'm going to be leading an eight-week uh, long book study. Um, it goes, we read a book and then there's going to be videos. This, uh, it's going to be for women only, unless a man wants to join and lead the men. But, um, so if you're interested in learning more, 
uh, about self recovery and maybe doing an eight week long course with me, go over there afterwards. All right, thank you. Sure, and, you know, go off, get some coffee, about 20 minutes, join her back in the room, and that would be great. So now, go out, enjoy the benefits of being part of the family of God. Get to know someone, help, help them, allow them to help you to grow healthy spiritually. Support each other, and above all, show the love that Christ has shown you. So now go out with the blessings of the Lord Almighty, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. May those be with you always. Amen.